professors and graduate students and really excited discussions about uh, what's happening here and particularly with the new uh, interdisciplinary measures that your proposed president are taking uh, and the limitation of funds. It just sounds like it's going to be an exciting time with Virginia Tech. Really excited. So uh, I'll be following you uh, to see how so, things go. That's the one thing. One thing I'm like more excited about oh. that wonderful thing that you bring. audience should know and should have seen before. The first is just a diagram of the growth of the size of the brain. This is just the sort of the, a physical estimate of the total size at a particular age in relation to the size it will be as an adult, right? The interesting thing about this curve is if you were deciding when investments should be made in human development, if you were to decide when would you invest, well, look at, look at that growth curve. You know, at one year of age, 70% of its total size. And five years of age, when we send them to school, 92% of its total size. I mean, that's just an interesting statistic. And it, it suggests that instead of waiting for interventions that begin in high school or beyond, that interventions in the first five years would pay off. And that, in fact, is what the economists, the Nobel laureate, uh, Heckman, and Gates Foundation, and everybody else who's estimated the value of intervening at a time in which you can make a difference to a, a, a child's life, the first five years is looking like the place to be. Why is the brain growing so rapidly? Well, again, I think most of the people in this room will have seen or heard this fact. Uh, early in development, at birth, you've got the 86 billion neurons that you currently have. They're all there. But the connections between them are not. 
And so you're forging connections. So the job of the baby brain is get all the neurons talking to one another. So they're growing these connections at a rate that's a, a million per second in the early period, so that by age three, they have three times the number that you and I have, right? And a pruning process, a systematic process of pruning those that are unneeded, the excess ones happens between that early phase, different timings for different parts of the brain, until the end of puberty. So you have parents often asking you when you give these talks, I, I want my baby not to prune. Can you tell me what to do? <laughs> and I tell them, you don't want your baby not to prune. Pruning is a good thing. Think of your rose bushes. Why do you prune them? To strengthen the remaining connections, the, the stalks that remain. So the brain prunes to strengthen the connections that remain. So you've got this system in which you've got to drive to overproduce the synaptic connections that allow brain areas to speak to one another, and then you've got a systematic pruning across all areas of the brain to end up with a more adult, you know, a sort of set brain uh, for adulthood. So these are, are, are things that we've known for some time, but now our MRI studies allow us to, to trace in a more um, a sort of interesting way, the long-range white matter connections between brain areas. And this is not a finished product, but it gives you some sense of what we're going to be able to see. So we see here the seven-monther, the 11-monther, and a 26-monther, and we're plotting myelin. And myelin is the, you know, uh, the brighter color, so the yellow is the highest and red is almost to that high. But look at the size changes between 7, 11, and 26 months, and look at the myelin growth. What's fun about these studies is that we will be able to trace the um, factors in that baby's environment with the growth of these white matter tracks across different areas of the brain. And so you can look in areas related to executive function, to language, and look at the activities in homes that can promote these kinds of activities. So these are new measures in our laboratory. Again, not a finished study, just a glimmer of what we're going to be able to see when we start combining these functional, structural, and um, behavioral measures. So keep in mind the fact that the, the brain is sculpting itself from a physiological standpoint when you look at data of a totally different kind. So here we have a learning curve uh, related to a critical period for humans. So biologists have for a long time understood that there are critical periods in the development of, of animal models. And so the famous one is vision, and binocular vision requires both eyes to be open at a critical moment in development. Well, language also shows a critical period. The first seven years of life, if you find your age on the bottom and your learning skill is the cartoon version, but you can see quite easily that the children from zero to seven are geniuses, at acquiring a second language. But as you move past the age of seven, every two years there's a decline in the, the readiness with which you're going to learn, the uh, robustness of its representation in your brain, the thoroughness with which you understand the nuances of phonology and syntax. And we can begin to wonder, why is it with our <coughs> superior cognitive skills that we can't solve the problem that babies are solving naturally given exposure to um, a second language. And another, so it's a grand puzzle to, to try to study. It's also interesting because from the standpoint of developmental disabilities, this is when they take hold, especially those involving language. So whether it's autism or fragile X or specific language impairment or dyslexia, it's the first five years when these things are really taking hold and changing the trajectory of a child's life. And so being able to understand what's actually supposed to go on during that early period and what are the earliest biomarkers, if you will, of the trajectory that suggests a developmental disability in the hope that very early, when the system is plastic, you can get in with effective interventions and make a difference. So that's sort of the, the, the puzzle we're after here, trying to understand what is it that allows language to develop in a particular child and what happens when it's not developing typically. So my approach has been to take the earliest learning that babies do. What is the first thing they have to learn? And that is the sounds that the language that they happen to be born listening to, what are the sounds that are used, the consonants and vowels that make up words in that language? That's what their job is, to figure out among all of the languages of the world and all of the sounds used across those languages, some 40-odd 
units that are different across line, which ones are going to be critical when I start to learn words. So uh, a little bit about those units and speech, um, a little bit about the physics and also what your mouth is doing. So if you look at the top, we're contrasting two vowels, ah and a. Ah. Ah, um, these are phonetic transcriptions. So ah left and a ah right. You can think about ah, ah, what your tongue is doing, and it's outlined here in yellow what that tongue body is doing. And then at the bottom, you see the physics of the situation where what, you, what you're doing when you produce sound is blowing through the airwave and shaping your mouth to uh, you know, produce resonances of the vocal tract. And those resonances appear as what we call formant frequencies, F1, F2, F3. And in this case, it's a small nuance in F2, small frequency change in F2 that distinguishes ah from ah. And these are, you know, nobody speaks like ah, ah. They do what I'm doing, which is to race through, and your mouth is going crazy if you've ever seen um, films of the articulators at work. It's quite an amazing little ballet in there. And the complexity that's produced and the nuances of the changes, microseconds in, uh, in differences in loudness and in um, you know, frequency changes, uh, in duration, and, and these small things, to begin to think that babies have to learn this, not only which ones, but how to differentiate them. How do they do that? And so we began with this puzzle in the 80s and 90s when I traveled across uh, the world, especially in the 90s. I had labs in about six, seven different countries. So in Japan um, and in Stockholm and in Russia and in Sweden, in France and Spain to use a technique that, that could be used any place. It was a portable um, head turn conditioning uh, uh, procedure that I used to ask what differences can babies hear? And here's what that technique looked like. Ah. Oh, sorry. Ah. 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 I forgot that. Um, computers have a problem. Even though they're now, Siri is working at the word level, no computer in the world can take phonetic units and decide you know, how to group them into categories. It, it's too complicated, they're too different. You just heard the ahs of 12 different people, males, females, and children. While you knew they were ahs, computers don't, especially when you contrast them with those same speakers producing ah. 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 Isn't sound wonderful? You know the size of the person approximately. You know whether they're male or female. You can certainly tell if it's a child. Uh, sophisticated listeners can tell if a person is smiling because it changes the form of frequencies. Um, so sound is, is, is sort of exquisitely detailed, and we're quite well tuned into it. So um, just to explain how small these differences are. Well, here's the technique we use to across the world with the world's children and the sounds of different languages to discern whether they could hear these differences or not. So, Here's that. Can a baby as young as six months old hear the difference between two vowels? This baby is trained to look for the toy when the sound changes. She's being distracted, so she'll turn only when she hears the difference in sounds. The key question, will she turn before the toy lights up? Okay, that baby's a genius and she knows it, right? She knows, she's really smart. So all across the planet, kids at six months can be trained within 20 trials to do this. And you can test any number of sound contrasts from different languages to figure out what the kids can do in the beginning. They're only six months old. And then to see how does that change as they're bathed in one language as opposed to another. So the discovery was that the children are what we like to call citizens of the world. They can hear all the distinctions made in all languages while the parents sitting behind them have, have no clue other than for the sound contrasts used in the languages, language or languages they've been exposed to in the first seven years. So babies have this special capacity. They're citizens while the parents sitting behind them are, uh, you know, uh, culture-bound listeners, right? They're into the culture that they have, the architecture of the brain has focused on. And so the next question is, when do they change? When do the citizens of the world become the language-bound listeners that we are? And the answer is before their first birthday. 
in studies done across the, the world, and here's just one done in Tokyo and Seattle, we were testing a contrast of importance to English but not Japanese, so the babies were hearing ra, 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 and then la was the change contrast. They had three seconds to turn their heads before they, uh, if they didn't turn once we're done with training, they don't turn, the um, toy in the box doesn't light up. Control trials assess that they're not just you know, turning every 20 seconds or something. So you can figure out uh, with 20 to 30 trials whether or not the infants in this culture can hear this contrast. And so then you can test them later. So in this study, like most of our others, we were testing between six and eight months and then testing in 10 to 12 months. And you can see this curve produced literally across you know, 30 to 50 studies across, across the world. So in this one, American and Japanese infants are totally equivalent at the first measurement point. They're about 65% um, percent correct, and that's well above the 50% chance, but not where they're going to get to. So two months later, the American kids in this study are zooming forward, and the Japanese kids are going down, and that's exactly the pattern that each of those sets of babies should be doing to learn their language. Ba Japanese babies should be ignoring that RL difference to acquire Japanese and American infants have to concentrate on it because they're gonna learn words, read, lead, that differ by that RL contrast. And this is the pattern we saw all over the world. So the question is what's going on during that little window? Uh, you can take yourself to Paris or uh, you know, to um, Russia and try to learn that language, but you are not gonna learn it in the way that these kids are doing that in this sort of magical critical period early in development. You can do the same thing, and we did this eh, about 15 years ago. We began doing studies with brain measures. We thought brain measures would take us closer to the mechanisms inside. So this runs exactly like the head turn, except the baby doesn't have to do anything. Baby's wearing ERP type in the, you know, event related potentials cap. The sensors are picking up brain waves. There's a background sound called the standard. You see the brain wave in blue. And then there's the change trial, the deviant stimulus, and it produces the red line. So all kids at six months for all contrasts in all languages will give you this reliable MMN, mismatch negativity. And then the two months later, in that 10 to 12 month window, that MMN will disappear for all non-native contrasts. So you can see the baby beginning to focus. And our studies have shown that whether it's the behavioral measure or the brain measure, this change that happens between six months and 12 months predicts the trajectory of language learning to three years, predicts reading readiness at age five. I don't know of any other measure that is as good at predicting outcomes with the evidence of learning in that early phase. And we know it's not just acuity. It's not just the kids are good who can hear better or the kids are, are better who are smarter because if you do that same learning curve, the trajectory modeling with a native and non-native contrast, it's the native uh, behavior between six and that change, that uh, increase in native that predicts positive growth curve, but kids who stay good at the non-native, meaning they're not selectively attending to the right stuff in the culture, their language grows more slowly. So both curves, the native and the non-native, with hierarchical linear modeling, show predictive differences, significant predictive differences, but in the opposite direction. The better you are at native, the faster you'll move. The better you are at non-native, even at seven and a half months, the slower you'll move. Because it's got to do with learning. It's got to do to att with attention. And so that first learning you do of language is really predicting something very important about the language network and, and what it's doing. So again, we go back to that question, what's what's going, what kind of learning is this? So you, you look back to learning theorists to try to tell you what kind of learning is this, and Americans were, we were kind of stuck in this Canarian learning model. What's learning? Well, it's learning that's governed by reinforcement and shaping and, you know, something quite conscious that the parents might be doing to kids. But those of us watching language development said, Parents are completely clueless about the fact that these kids are changing. Who would know unless you did the science that babies are changing as they're laying in their cribs, listening, playing with you, how that this trajectory is going on. So we knew it wasn't, it's not Skinnerian reinforcement, operant conditioning. That's the kind of learning. So the learning models became 
much more sophisticated and more about the implicit, ab the ability of humans to learn, animals to, just by mere exposure to complex stimuli with statistical irregularities, that we're really good at picking up statistical regularities. And so statistical learning is, um, uh, over the past 15 years, we've learned a ton about how uh, infants are automatically picking up the statistics of the exposure that they have. And the new thing we added to that was that the statistics that babies take appear to need a human being to deliver the stimulus. So let, let's see how that looks. So stat learning is this sense that exposure to stimulation causes learning even in the absence of any kind of external reinforcer. It just happens. Brains just do this. And one of the more interesting studies is that we demonstrated recently, Chris Moon, uh, a psychologist in my laboratory, and I did a study with um, Hugo Legenkrantz in uh, Stockholm, and we compared the newborn nursery babies in Stockholm with the newborn nursery uh, babies in Seattle to ask whether or not, we had already learned from her studies and others that babies are learning in the last 10 weeks of a mother's pregnancy to recognize her voice, and, and also learn the uh, temporal pattern of, uh, of, of a story that she would read uh, in the last 10 weeks of pregnancy. And uh, Christine and I showed that they are learning something about the vowels of the two languages. So here's the study, babies in the newborn nursery, a suck on the pacifier will turn on one of the synthesized vowels, and as long as the baby sucks, that vowel continues, it'll switch to a new vowel in the random order as soon as the baby slows sucking down. So here's what this looks like. It's very interesting to see the baby's eyes. Go. It's not going. Oh, boo. All right, hang on. You've got to see this because it's so fun. Um, uh, let's see if this works. If it doesn't, we'll go back. Oh, dear. All right, we won't do that. Okay, well, what you see is that this baby um, turns on sound by sucking, and this is a newborn. This is a newborn nursery, and the baby will look around you know, where's that sound coming from? Suck, 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 suck. And then, of course, tire of sucking, go on to the next, you know, stop for a while, and then the next sound will appear. And the answer to the, um, to the question is that babies in both countries preferred the vowels spoken in the foreign language. So baby has been in the womb listening for 10 weeks to mom talking away, and by that time knows the and knows enough about some of the vowels in that language to prefer the vowels of a new language. And so we show that, uh, that this novelty, it's a kind of novelty preference uh, in the newborn, and what that tells you is that learning of this statistical variety, so the most popular uh, units are learned and memorized, and then the baby's ready for something new. Okay, so, all right, we took this jog. Here we go. Now it works. <laughs> I think it's wonderful. So Anyway, humans learn always and everywhere, wherever you are, your brains are being altered by the statistics of input. Uh, so that's just scary just a little bit, right? So it matters what we put in front of kids. Whether it's a visual stimulus, an auditory stimulus, or an action movie, babies are taking note of the high frequency events. And that's what their brains tend to settle on, and it's part of the answer as to how in the plethora of sounds that we all produce, that they land on the phonemes of the language because they're attending to the most popular ones, in the high frequency events. So, but as the kids move on and listen to a lot of the language, they begin to take statistics on the distributions of the language as a whole. So in the next clip, I'm gonna play an American woman speaking uh, baby's favorite signal, which is motherese or parentese, and then I'll show you the kinds of statistics they're deriving from listening. You'll hear an American woman and then a Japanese woman. <gasps> I love your big blue eyes. So pretty and nice. Wow, 
Okay, this is mother's milk to the baby brain. And this is the kind of statistics that the babies appear to be extracting from listening to us. That if you take any set of sounds, if you take a, a, a sketch of, of Japanese or English, in English you would see, uh, this is a cartoon, but you'd see a bimodal distribution of the acoustics in that space. Whereas in Japanese, that intermediate flap, you would not get canonical R's and L's, you'd get that intermediate. And the studies suggest that if you expose babies to these distributions at the critical time, you can make them behave more like Japanese kids and fail to hear that distinction, or, or behave more like American kids and hear that distinction. And you can do that in a very simple laboratory experience, experiment with not that much exposure, demonstrating their sensitivity to the statistics of input. But the modification of that understanding came with an experiment that we designed to, to look at something totally different. I was going, to, I wanted to ask if, if babies are learning during this critical moment, and here's a portrayal of the results of, of a study on the Chinese contrast. To me, it's xi xi. I cannot hear the difference between them. Um, at the time, I had six graduate students, postdocs, whose native language was Mandarin. And so we designed an intervention with the American kids, exposing them in 12 sessions to Mandarin for the first time. The question was, can they derive statistics right here at this time in development? Why have they waited so long to make the change? If they're doing statistics, and we know they can do statistics in the newborn, they can do it in the womb. Why would it take them nine months? One hypothesis was they're building up the distributions. It takes time to learn what the distribution of the language is. And the other is that something else is happening at that period that makes it possible just then. So we exposed the babies to 12 sessions, 25 minutes each. They heard four different talkers. Um, I'll let you hear what those sessions were like. Jasper, Okay, so how's your Mandarin coming along, right? So we want, what do you do to a baby's brain when you expose them to this brand new language for the first time during that moment in development when they're doing that thing? Uh, and we contrasted their learning with a control group because we worried that just bringing them into the lab and giving them 12 sessions of language um, it would, might change everything about their sensitivity to contrast. So we had the American graduate students with the same dosage and everything, same books and toys, but speaking English as a control group, and then tested all of them later on this Chinese contrast. And so you see there that exposure to English doesn't do anything to their Mandarin skills, thank goodness, because otherwise you wouldn't have a study. And, but look what happened to the babies exposed to Mandarin for those 12 sessions. They were statistically equivalent to the kids growing up in Taiwan who'd been listening all this time. So the answer to our question was yes, they can extract statistics at this time, but they don't need nine months worth of listening. They can do it right here, right now, with 12 sessions, about five hours of exposure. So something's coming online now that makes them uniquely available to, to respond to that experience. And because we'd been watching the babies, we wanted to ask the following question. They, kids loved their exposure sessions. They would watch the door in the waiting room to see when their tutors would come in. We could tell they were happy in these in these sessions. And so we asked whether or not the person was critical. What happens if you take the same material, we filmed beautiful DVDs, and you bring in a new group, and you do the same exposure study, but over a television set? What do you do to their brains under those conditions? And we had done an auditory-only condition. We thought the video condition would work. We thought that the, um, a second condition was audio-only exposure. They looked at a teddy bear. Um, we thought they would be learning, and particularly watching the kids in the video condition, because they'd crawl up to the TV, because they stared at it, because some of them touched it, they looked like they were attending. So it came as a surprise that audio only had no learning effects whatsoever, but that video didn't either. None, zero, they were just flat. No learning whatsoever. 
So we have this contrasting situation where you get near perfect learning with a live tutor and you get zip, nothing, no learning whatsoever with a disembodied source. So what's happening? And we began to think about the fact that social skills do come online. About that time in development, kids begin to be able to track eye movements. They begin to use social referencing. They begin to watch what you look at. And so we got very curious about what's going on in the brain. And then we decided to, this is why we invested in the $2.5 million machine, to see what, if you put a little baby in a giant machine, what is it that the brain tells you that you couldn't have learned any other way? And we were the first to try this because the Finns who created the machine had been doing sleeping baby studies, didn't think it was tractable to put an awake baby in there because they're moving. And it's completely non-invasive. It's completely silent. She's listening over insert earphones. But the idea was that you still wanted to know where the brain structures were. So it took the physicists, and in particular, Samu Twalu, who's our director, who was working for the company at, a, at the time. It's a technical tour de force, and 11 patents later, that he invented the head tracking system that allows you to keep track in all three dimensions where that head is, and then correct for the head location so that you actually can track structures. And here's, here's the result uh, that we, uh, that we got from the, our initial studies on MEG with a, a monolinguals. We now have it in bilinguals, but this is a monolingual 12 monther. We're tracking auditory areas and brocas, the motor planning area, and looking now at the arcuate, these connective tissues between. And what you're going to see here is bubbles, the strength and, and brightness of the bubbles reflect volumetric um, reactions, the, the activation in these brain areas. So again, the, the standard program, it was a lot like head turn. There's a background sound and two test sounds, one in the same language as the background sound, English, and one in a foreign language, Spanish. So uh, two things of note. First, we were the first to observe, and the only way you could observe it is by doing brain imaging, that when kids listen to speech, but not non-speech, uh, their motor centers that plan ahead are very, very active right from the first millisecond. So you see Broca's area and the cerebellum very active, as though the brain is rehearsing the social response. How, what do I have to do to get into this conversation? And then the second finding, so that's true at seven months. The Broca's area and the cerebellum to all of speech, native or non-native, is reacting to that sound. And then by 12 months, what you see is that Broca's, the activation, becomes much stronger to the non-native sound. So when you think about that for a while, uh, and you think about the literature on predictive coding and the AI approach to how does the stimulus get analyzed, uh, analysis by synthesis is one of the early um, arguments about how speech recognition works. That and a device, when given input, tries to hypothesize what would it take to produce that. What we think baby brains are doing right from the beginning is being active in the idea, in the rehearsal practically, um, of what it's going to take to do what that signal, what produces that signal. In a sense, it's a kind of social drive to respond. And that it gets hard by 12 months to invent how you pronounce something like a French vowel or a Spanish consonant that's not in your repertoire. So at six months, it's equivalent for all sounds. But by 12 months, it has completely changed with regard to the motor system's response. So it's very exciting. Brain imaging gives you a peek at what's going on inside and invents theoretical positions you couldn't have had simply by looking at the behavioral data. So this social response, and I'll go through this very briefly, What's the social do to? As you start thinking about what is social doing that the TV can't do, we decided that both information is provided and motivation is provided. Information because kids are watching eye gaze. When you measure the eye gaze following that the babies were doing, they both look at each other and they look at the tutor and the toy. As toys are held up, babies focus on the tutor's eyes and this object, looking for a referent. The babies with more sophisticated social responses are the ones whose brain responses to learning are accelerated. So that's what you see in this graph. Gaze shifts that are higher 
in the babies at the critical moments are correlated with the best brain responses of the detection of the contrast. And then recently, we learned something about motivation. We have done studies just recently looking at whether two babies learning together in a hard learning condition from the video is better than a baby learning alone. And that hypothesis was driven by data in the original experiment. Whenever babies were in these social exposures together, their brain responses are higher. And, but it wasn't randomly, it wasn't randomly assigned, so we had no clue whether this is real or just spurious. So we designed a hard condition. Babies are now learning from the TV. They press the screen to turn it on, which we hoped would, and it did, increase motivation. It increased attention. So the baby's getting a 20-second clip of the original videos that didn't work um, every time she hits the screen. And when she, she takes her hand away, and then it will go to checkerboard, and she has to um, hit it again. And we compared randomly assigned babies who were learned alone or learned together. And the answer was clear as a bell. Um, you only see this characteristic MMN signature in the paired infants. The ones who learned alone were flat. And so in the gray area, um, I won't take the time to walk through this, but the gray area is this MMN, and you see the blue line up showing a high MMN only in the paired infants. So it takes two to learn from a video. And we hypothesize they must be teaching each other, right? They must be showing each other how to hit the screen, or they must be, you know, learning together. So we analyzed the videotape. No, it wasn't that. They're looking at each other, but they're not showing each other. They're not doing anything like that. So we then hypothesized, well, maybe getting familiar with your partner learner the more sessions you have with a given baby, so we've got the target baby and then the partner babies, and we analyzed, are the kids who get the most consistent partner baby learning better? Again, the opposite. The more novel the baby, the higher the MMN brain response, and here's that data. So we're plotting the MMN to the novel stimulus against the number of unique partners. So we're talking about a hormonal, biological response to the mere presence of another human being, I think. I mean, we don't, we don't have heart rate measures, we don't have cortisol measures, but it looks like learning is promoted by novelty. At first, it's promoted by being paired with another baby. That's our first effect. But the second one is that novelty is very good in a social situation. So maybe, again, you look to evolution to say, is it important to attend to a new social person, yeah, probably. Not someone you know, but you're, you're kind of attentive when the person is new to your social world. So this is the first time this kind of thing, tying a motivational kind of response to learning. And this, of course, reminds me of, this is my daughter's work, so I love talking about it. She's a neuroscientist interested in autism. And she's looking at the brain's reward systems. So the reward system, the, your response to a stimulus, whether it's rewarding or not, uh, can be ascertained by looking at what's called the SPN. Again, it's a neuroscience component that's well understood. Uh, Steve Hilliard discovered it. What she did was uh, had kids play a game while, while the, between 5 and 12 years of age. They're wearing an a, a ERP cap, and they're guessing. And it's random. They are all told they're correct 50% of the time. But the feedback comes in the form of a face smiling or frowning. I'm just so showing you the smiling one. Or an arrow up and down. And what you see plotted is the reward responses in typically developing or autistic populations in that age range. And what you see is that typically developing kids are highly rewarded by faces, by feedback from faces, positive or negative, just faces not by arrows, but that the children with autism are just the opposite. They love the arrows. Their reward systems respond to arrows. And as my daughter says, the good news is the reward system is working in children with autism. It's working. It's just working for different stimuli. And this is really important to understand learning in children with autism. OK, so moving to, I want to just briefly mention, I think, really exciting interventions that every parent and every teacher should know about. Um, as a developmentalist, you begin to understand how much parents are the agents of change. If you're interested in the 
uh, roles of experience and the effects of socioeconomic status which pervade the literature, uh, the effects showing that lower SES, kids coming from lower SES families are just at a huge disadvantage. You understand that the opportunities to learn, that SES is a proxy for opportunities to learn. And one of the things that parents do habitually is this thing called parentese. You've already heard these two examples of the American woman and the Japanese woman speaking in this parentese pattern. Here's what it looks like. Um, if a, a woman with a baby's in the lab and she's at the top AD, so adult directed speech, she says, I had a little bit and the doctor gave me bendectin for it. It's not boring, it's not without inflection, it's sort of the way I'm speaking, it, it, it has inflection, but it's not what you see at the bottom. She turns to her two month and she says, can you say ah? Say ah, hey you, say hi. And then she goes up to 700 hertz, hi, I can't do that. Um, not without a baby and you know, too tired. But you know, this, this is a signal that's again, ubiquitous across the world's speakers that in the presence of a baby, unconsciously you're slowing speech down, you're hitting your targets and speaking more clearly, you've got this intonation contour that's very captivating. And we can show again the physics of the situation. Um, when we measured uh, English, Russian, and Swedish moms speaking to their infants versus another adult, that blue triangle is how we talk to one another, quite reduced. The red triangle is what we do when we talk to babies. We kind of clean up our act. We also increase the variance. It's a huge distribution out there, but you make it easier because you've pulled out the stimuli and you've made it clearer. They're, you know, better, better articulations, better acoustic definition. And when you measure using LENA devices, uh, so these little brilliant microphones that all the graduate students want after today, um, so audience administrators, please support them and buy this equipment for the graduate students and the faculty. Um, when parents and parents' kids are wearing the microphones 24-7 for a few days, what you get is the auditory world of the child. You know if the TV's on, you know how many people are talking to them, whether they're talking in groups or one-on-one, -on -one, whether they're speaking parentees or not. You know everything about the auditory world of that child. When you plot, for 11-monthers or 14-monthers, this is the 11-monther data, the percentage prevalence of parentees, especially one-on-one. -on -one. When parentees is spoken one-on-one, -on -one, meaning one adult speaking to that baby, the effects relationship between that prevalence and language at 24 months is quite amazing. You can see that on the left, and we've replicated that two or three times. Whereas standard speech has no effect at all. So standard speech is just standard speech, doesn't have a negative or positive effect. It's not related to 24 month outcomes. So it appears in parents who are not told anything, we're just monitoring them, that the tendency to do this in homes is um, correlated with. Can't say anything about cause, but it's correlated with. And in fact, you can take SES out of the equation if you just look at parentees. It, you don't see SES effects if you just look at the role of parentees. If low SES parents are using parentees with high prevalence, there's no, you know, there's no detriment to language at 24 months. So I think that's interesting. So we began to do parent coaching studies where we bring uh, mothers into a randomized control trial at six, 10, and 14 months. We coach them by taking the recordings of their kids playing them for the parents and saying, here's what your baby's utterances sound like. And they say, is that language? I mean, that cooing, that, that's really language? And you show them what it's supposed to sound like. You show them what they sound like and show them the statistics that parents who tend to use this more have kids who tend to have higher language later. And you leave them to it. And what happens is you can see, and the control group is treated identically with regard, regard to the recordings of the kids. So at six, 10, and 14, they're, half of them are coached and we record the kids. At 14, 18, 24, and 30, we continue to record the kids. Coaching is over, um, but the control uh, families don't get the coaching, right? So what we can see is the red um, bar. Um, it, there's a big difference between uh, groups with regard to the amount of child-directed speech Parents tend, who are coached tend to talk more to their kids. They use parentees more when they're coached, and language outcomes in the kids are much better. 
and that language outcome improvement starts at 10 months. And this, what you're seeing plotted here is the 14-monther data. Now the kids are 30 months, and the gap between the experimental and controls gets bigger over time. Even though the coaching has stopped, parents have learned something about the importance of their language input to the kids. And turn-taking is way up. So I think the parents are getting you know, wildly reinforced by the exchanges back and forth between them and the children. I think you've made a change, at least is looking quite lasting. It's got legs out to 30 months, which, which is very exciting. And I think it helps us explain an early finding um, in five-year-olds. So this is a study in which we're, we have five-year-olds in an fMRI machine, and we're looking at their ability to rhyme. They're, pl they're playing a game, and we're watching Broca's area and looking at the activity in Broca's, which is critical to language and literacy. And we took many measures on these kids, their cognitive, social, um, IQ scores, but we also took SES measures of the family status, which is basically using the Hollingshead, it's their uh, education, maternal and paternal education, and um, their occupations, not income, but it correlates with income. The biggest driver of Broca's area from a statistical standpoint is the SES of the family. It accounts for the variance in a way that no other measure did. So again, opportunities to learn are critical. SES is a proxy for learning, and this isn't the level playing field. If this is what Broca's area looks like at age five, you're sending kids to school to learn to read in a situation in which the brains are not equivalent, you know, not equivalent at all. So it gives us some clue as to how important this early language input is. So I, I want to, I know we're running a little tight on time. Are, are we okay? I'd like to talk a little bit about the bilingual brain. Um, one of the graduate students and now um, a postdoc, Naya Farhan Ramirez, has been doing studies on the bilingual brain. And in this little clip that she narrates, she shows you how you prepare a, a language, a child for the MEG test where the baby's gonna listen to the sound. So this is Naya. First, we brought the 11-month-old babies into the lab with their parents. Half of the babies were from monolingual, English-only households. The other half of the babies, such as the one in this video, were from Spanish-English bilingual households. Our researchers first prepared the babies for data collection. They used a hat and a special digitizing pen to track the shape of the baby's head. This procedure allowed us to continuously monitor the baby's head position as they moved in the scanner. Then we brought the babies into the MEG room. They sat on a special high chair beneath the MEG helmet with their parents sitting nearby. The babies listened to a stream of sounds such as da's and ta's. Some of the sounds were specific to English and Spanish and some were common to both languages. Da, da, this baby da, is perfect. I mean, you have da, to admit, that's a perfect baby. Da, <laughs> da, da, da. When we looked at the brain responses, we found that at 11 months of age, the brains of monolingual babies are specialized in processing the sounds of English and are not sensitive to the sounds of Spanish. The brains of bilingual babies, on the other hand, are specialized to process both languages, Spanish and English. So we see clearly that babies born listening to both languages are responding equivalently to the language they have in common with monolinguals, English, and in addition, they have the Spanish skills. We also saw a great activity in the bilinguals in prefrontal that you don't see in, in the monolingual babies. And we think that's part of the switching exercise that babies at this age, if they're exposed to both languages, they're toggling back and forth between them. And I think we'll make this uh, pretty much the last um, set of slides that we have shown in these 11 month or kids, monolingual and bilingual, the superior skills of the bilinguals at being creative about the invention of a solution to a new problem. So we see in this task, um, the a child is looking for a toy in a plexiglass box, and the box is only open on one side. And so every baby, monolingual or bilingual, solves this task. They can get the toy out of that box when the door is only open on the one side. But the hard part comes when you turn the box around. You present the new problem. The baby sees that it's going in the other side. The door is now on the right side. But the, hab the habitual pattern to go to the old solution is the one that they do. And so repeatedly they will try the one that, the solution that worked before, like most of us do. Um, yet the bilingual baby, when faced with that same problem, 
um, again, solves the first problem. Everybody solves that first problem. Um, a lot of them push that box thinking it might pop out, I guess. Uh, but everybody can do this, and the timing of their skill on the first problem is equivalent. But the second problem, you'll see how readily this little bilingual child does. She goes back quickly to the old side, but then works really hard to, to get that toy out of, of the box. So the statistical result is quite convincing that the bilingual babies are just better at this aspect of cognition, not smarter in general, not higher IQs, but they're better at inventing a solution to a problem. So we've taken this bilingual, I've invented a method and curriculum, and we've taken it to, to Madrid, where the, all the little ones are in um, uh, neighborhood schools, and shown that in one hour a day of this kind of social play-based uh, infusion of, of language and, and this sort of interactive social learning, the red line represents at each age group the number of English vocalizations produced by the kids after 18 weeks of one hour a day compared to the traditional bilingual education being used in, in Madrid, in the blue line. We're back there. Now, this result is published. Um, their Spanish scores stayed the same, but their English scores uh, zoom up, and we're now back there with, um, in 13 schools uh, where the teachers and tutors are trained with software because you can't scale it up if you're training them you know, individually, which is what we did in the first study. And the first half of the year is over. It looks like we're replicating. We still have a second half of the year to go. But it's very exciting to imagine that if we ever get our kids in school here in America, uh, in those early uh, education type settings, I hope we do someday. But in a lot of Europe and Asia, the demand for learning a second language is very, very high. And just like us, the parents are not speaking that second language. They expect the schools to do it. The schools don't know how to do it. So here's a case in which brain science in the laboratory can give to uh, the educational systems across the world a method and a curriculum that will work. And, and here's our little bilingual graduates. So um, I have one more effect, but I'm just going to skip it. Um, we're demonstrating that early experience is really potent, not only for language, but for music. If babies, instead of hearing a second language, are hearing the waltz, the rhythm of a waltz, in many different variations over 12 sessions, and you, um, they come in in groups exactly like language, except they're now getting music. They play in groups. We do it 12 times, and that's what it looks like. That's the waltz, right? And the control group gets the same thing except same toys, same group, same everything, but no music, right? And the differences in their brains is quite stunning in both auditory cortex and prefrontal cortex. They're better at detecting errors in any rhythmic musical pattern, but also in speech for uh, Japanese and languages they've not heard. So we think we're training something like pattern detection that babies learn that there are patterns in the world, and that's fun, and they start looking for patterns, no matter what you have them listen to. It'd be fun to see how broad that effect is. But we think that the job of babies is sort of predict the world, predictive coding, understand what's going to happen next, and enjoy that. And it also makes you think about what happens in families in which there's no regularity, there are no games and, and experiences that are uh, kind of typical, predictable, but chaotic instead. So chaos doesn't produce pattern perception, whereas lots of games and things we do with kids in typical settings produces architecture that is good generally, not just for language, not just for music, but for predictive patterns generally. And I think, I think they, you don't need to see the brain results. And I'll end by saying it starts here. It starts with the first relationship that a child has uh, between parent and child. That dance that they engage in is, again, part of this pattern detection and a predictive coding that they learn to do. Um, we've yet to uncover just how critical this period is. Um, we've been looking at kids who are in foster care in the state of Washington, kids who pulled from the home because of chaos, because of a neglect or abuse. And when you take those kids at age five, even though they've been out of those homes for three years, and they're now in foster homes pretty well settled, compare them very closely matched on all dimensions with controls, their brains are different, thoroughly different. Um, in the MEG studies, when you present words, the brains of kids who have been in foster care are activated 
every place, not just in language areas where the control kids are just listening, and language areas at 200 milliseconds, the language area goes, yeah, that's a word. And kids in foster care, the brains are like all over, all over active, and a, a response maybe 200 milliseconds later in language areas. Again, I think chaos presents the kind of non-predictable pattern in, in the world's outcomes. And the MRI also shows um, you know, weak uh, pathways, white matter pathways between language and prefrontal cortex and, uh, and cortical thinning at age five in comparison to control. So early experience matters. That's the bottom line here. Um, early experience matters a lot. Uh, in the language domain, it's critical. There's a critical period, but it's interesting to imagine, are there critical periods for other things? Is there a critical period for social experience? Is there a critical period for other um, cognitive skills? What about mathematics? I mean, you should, it's a good thing to just think about whether or not there are windows of opportunity for various domains in which humans learn. And again, to underscore the implications for education, early learning matters, the social brain ladder matters. And then lastly, to thank the supporters. You can't do this work, it takes an army of people, it takes enormous amounts of money to do these kinds of studies um, with infants and wonderful colleagues across all countries. And so without the support, we wouldn't be able to do it. So I thank them and thank you. Yeah.